So, I'm interested in your journey. How did you get to DWT? Okay, long story short, I'm from Riverside, California. Growing up, my parents always used to take me to see Deaf West plays. I ended up going to Gallaudet for undergrad, and after graduating, I moved to L.A. Deaf West became my artistic home. Despite me having no involvement in the productions, I continued to show up for Deaf West shows as an audience member. I liked the community aspect of it all. Hanging out with the actors and other creatives motivated me, albeit slowly and over many years, to finally take the next step. My first job for Deaf West was to write a children's show. As time went on, I wore many different hats. I became an ASL master, learned how to produce plays, and in 2012, I took over as the artistic director. Prior to me taking over, Ed Waterstreet, Deaf West's founding artistic director, who's also deaf, had been at the helm. That makes me the second artistic director in Deaf West's 30-year history. We were the first deaf-led theater company in the West and hope to still be around for many years to come. So in your journey, as you learned the ropes, stepped into your role and learned different skills, what made you realize that you could have been an executive director? Did you have a mentor? I just want to be clear, in my role as artistic director, I function more like a producer rather than a director of shows. As the artistic director, I work with the company to make decisions around the vision and mission of Deaf West. For example, I'm involved with show selection, casting, selecting potential partners, and deciding whether to do a straight play or a musical. All of these types of decisions fall on me as the artistic director. I haven't actually directed any of our shows yet, maybe someday I will, but lucky for me, I've had a fantastic role model to look up to, Ed Waterstreet. Since I began working with Deaf West, I watched Ed lead the company, saw his process, and was able to glean a lot from him. Ed's always given me good advice. He told me the most important thing you can do as the artistic director is to have a clear vision. If the vision is clear, everything else will fall into place. I've never veered from this lesson Ed shared with me. If Deaf West has a clear vision, then it's much easier for me to do my job. Every decision must be in line and in support of the vision. Without a clear vision, my journey is much more arduous. The bottom line for us here at Deaf West is that we do have a shared vision. Create community through theater. We create quality theater both deaf and hearing audiences will enjoy. We don't just do deaf or ASL theater. We create quality theater for all to enjoy. It's also part of our shared vision to elevate theater as a whole, advance our craft, and push boundaries. We prefer innovation over playing it safe. That's exciting. I know that you just produced Orphe, which is unfortunately on hold due to COVID-19. I'm curious about that process. How did you decide on that story in the casting? It all started when we got an offer from an organization in Tokyo, Japan. They stipulated that it was to be a family-friendly play. I started searching for something that was family-friendly and could do well here as well as in Tokyo. It needed to be engaging for both American and Japanese audiences. The eventual director of Orphe brought me the script. And Orphe is based on a Greek myth, then adapted by a French playwright, Jean Cocteau. After reading the script, I was blown away. It felt so modern, even though it was written in 1926. It felt fresh and new. It was comical and had a plot full of twists and turns that I thought audiences were sure to enjoy. After we settled on Orphe, we began casting. We did a nationwide search. We accepted online video submissions as well as held traditional auditions for casting. It came down to the wire, but we got a cast together, flew everybody in, and began our six-week rehearsal process. And then COVID-19 hit. Our show opened and closed on the same night. 
it was hard to see that one go. Hopefully we will get another chance to remount the show. The actors did great work and we hope, as we do with all of our shows, that they can be seen and appreciated by as many people as possible. Even though we produce two or three shows a year, each one is our baby. And for now, Orphe still remains in the wings, but we hope that one day you'll be able to appreciate all the work that we put into it. COVID-19 has presented those of us in theater with a new challenge. Must theater stay within the theater? The short answer is no. Theater needs to continue to branch out and innovate. We should be viewing this as an opportunity rather than a barrier to our success. We need to be thinking, what can we do that works now and in the future? For example, many deaf artists have excelled on social media platforms like Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. That's a new and burgeoning landscape. I'm interested to see where that leads, all the while making sure that Deaf West continues to support deaf artists, deaf talent, from diverse backgrounds. Oh, the importance of collaborating with hearing people, I absolutely get. But at the same time, I don't want us to lose our authenticity. And it's important, of course, I just watched a TED Talk about the importance of having deaf and hearing actors in Spring Awakening, the cultural representation of sign language with dialogue in both signed and spoken language, believing in the talent of both actors who were experienced and those who were still learning and new to the stage. There's value in working together. But I wonder, how can we support that process, but at the same time, not being so reliant on hearing people? But yes, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just... I'm not sure that our production of Spring Awakening relied on the hearing cast members to carry the show. To be honest, I think the hearing actors relied on the deaf company members. I think that at a deaf-led theater company like Deaf West, we create a space for hearing and deaf artists to come and play, experiment, and grow. In the theater world, that type of playground is rare. That playground also doesn't often exist in the real world. It's in that space where beautiful things happen. In that space, everyone must learn from one another. The process isn't perfect, no, but that process results in a community of deaf and hearing actors working together in two languages and two cultures to present theater composed by the collective. I think that's what audiences find so engaging about our work and Spring Awakening in particular. It was a place where deaf and hearing actors were equals. Spring Awakening wasn't the pinnacle of success for Deaf West. We can do more. We can build on that experience as we move forward. We can always do better. Always. At the same time, you're right. How do you create narratives that are rooted within the Deaf community, centered in the Deaf experience, without slipping into a place in the mainstream where the narratives feel inauthentic? That's something that we need to work on more, and we need to look to others as examples. It was great for the two of us to get together last year at the Deaf Theater Action Plan Summit. One important takeaway for me from that convening was that there is no one Deaf experience. Deaf people come from diverse backgrounds, choose different paths in life. There are POC Deaf people, the Deaf Blind community, each person has their own experiences, and my experience is not better than anyone else's. There really is no one deaf experience. That's something I think our community has struggled with. We've tried to distill the multitude of experiences into one, and it's impossible. My lived experience is different from yours. I want to hear your story. I want to see your story. And not just you, but others as well. It's important to invite others in so that we can share their stories. It's a challenge sometimes for our community to support that micro process. But I want to see that happen. That's the future I'm hoping for. I want to see deaf Asian playwrights, deaf Latino playwrights, deaf blind playwrights. That's the future that excites me. That's more exciting than just having more deaf playwrights in general. Supporting diverse individuals results in more authentic stories that are more interesting, too. And on the subject of playwrights, hearing playwrights have a support system. They have writing groups, a built-in community to test material with. 
It's often how hearing playwrights are able to advance their careers. How can we do something similar for deaf playwrights? How can we create the same opportunities? I'd like to see more of that moving forward too. I don't want deaf playwrights to feel they have to work and write in the hearing world in order to succeed and break through. I want them to succeed on their own terms, whatever they might be. It's not important if that success comes from working in the hearing or deaf worlds, or even both for that matter. I have a feeling that deaf playwrights who can capture both worlds in one story will do very well. I hope that deaf theater is able to consider providing more opportunities for deaf writers to develop their work and not continuing to feature the same people, but branching out to a variety of artists or create opportunities to share work among the theater community. In chatting with many of our audience members, I get a recurring thread that continues to come up. We're all craving that pure storytelling, stories told in our language, ASL. We're all craving good theater, craving ASL that's like music to our eyes. We want to be presented with new experiences, new ideas, new characters, and new points of view. That's what we're seeking right now. We don't have enough diverse stories, and this motivates me to create more theater for our community. That's something that's somewhat of a holy grail for Deaf West, something we're always striving for. And what can we offer without, well, without barriers? Because not everyone has Zoom. Some people don't have internet at all. So how can we make our work more creatively accessible to everyone, to the widest possible range of people? What what do audiences really need from us right now? There are a lot of challenges we are currently facing. We're all Zooming every day for multiple hours, and Zoom fatigue is real. I'm done with Zoom. I am ready to see people in 3D again. But while we must work in Zoom, we have to think about how to foster collaboration and creativity in a 2D environment. That's a novel challenge for us. We're used to being in the same room together and riffing off of one another. With Zoom, communication has to be so structured and organized. Everyone has to wait their turn. The Zoom format doesn't gel with the deaf community norms. Zoom has slowed everything down. It's definitely been a challenge. And at the same time, we have to reframe and realize that online theater isn't going away. We need to look to who's succeeding in a virtual world. There's some really great work on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and some beautiful vloggers too. I've really enjoyed a lot of their work. It's almost equal to theater. This is the new frame we have, a new way of seeing, and a new means of entertainment for our community. What I wonder is, what if it didn't, well, of course, money is always a factor, but if we look at theater, why not hire a creative team of deaf people? Directors, stage designers, lighting designers. Of course, there are a limited few in this field who are deaf, but how can we convince theaters Maybe they just don't know about us because we haven't had an opportunity to showcase our work. Where are those opportunities to share our work if they're not including deaf people in theater? I'm thinking of assistant directors, mentoring, networking. That's the same concern many of us have about bigger theaters out there. Often they hire people who claim to know about deaf culture, and that claim is good enough for the theater. We need to hold them accountable, accountable for authentic, authentic inclusion, making sure that it's done right, making sure that deaf audience members are there to see their language and culture on that scale. There are some deaf people out there who aren't familiar with our culture. That's our opportunity to showcase our role models on stage. If it's done in the wrong way, then that will be imprinted on the minds of our deaf children. Then we're responsible for reinforcing the status quo. I feel like in my time thus far in the industry, we keep repeating the same cycle. I have to educate and then re-educate others. I've accepted that education is part of my role, but it's worn on me. When can we have time to just focus on our own art? I sometimes feel that politics and navigating politics actually hurts our art. That's something that's been on my mind a lot. I wish that there was a clear pathway we could use to bring our art to the world. But maybe that's unrealistic. I don't know. Okay, on that note about deaf and hearing audiences, how do we bring stories that are authentic and connected to the human experience? Because regardless of being deaf or hearing, we all have feelings, experiences, struggles. People forget that we have feelings. 
that's what it is to be human. And it's our job to bring those stories to a mix of diverse audiences so they can make that connection, to have that aha moment through an experience that they've never seen before. In this brief conversation today, we've just scratched the surface. There's a lot going on behind the scenes as well. I mean, to mention one now, deaf designers, set designers, lighting designers, they deserve more opportunities to work. Non-deaf theaters tend to disregard their need for access. Deaf directors, how do we foster more deaf directors in the field? I mean, that's its own bucket. Where's the pathway for deaf producers like you and I? Where can we thrive in our careers? After Deaf Spotlight, what would be the next logical step in your career? I wonder about this. We often forget about these other pieces of the puzzle. But in our industry, there's a saying, the play's the thing. Sometimes we have to ignore things we otherwise wouldn't in order to put on a good production. A production that could change hearts and minds and blow people away. For me, that's why I'm in theater. To me, it's the best kind of activism. There's a way that people respond to art that could never be matched by someone giving a lecture or someone writing a book. It's something about our society. People would rather come see a show for a couple hours and leave having a deeper understanding of our community. You know, one great example I'm thinking of is in regards to casting and directing too, the ability to see the broader context at play and not just cast hearing actors in all the roles, but to include an actor who, say, uses a wheelchair, even if it's not part of the script. And I'm thinking of the actor Allie, who was in Spring Awakening. She was the first person who uses a wheelchair to be on Broadway, and later she went on to win a Tony for her performance in Oklahoma, which is just great. So... There's an opportunity there for people to realize what is possible, right? No, it wasn't about seeing an opportunity. It was just that we saw the talent she had. She was a triple threat. She was beautiful, had a great singing voice, and could act. It wasn't until much later that we realized she was the first actress in a wheelchair on Broadway. And we said to ourselves, oh, okay, let's keep working on the show. That was our mindset. I mean, maybe it did work in her favor that we were deaf, who's to say? But I'm thrilled that Allie came out of our community, too. We're all in this together. Deaf people, wheelchair users. Together, we can have more successes more often. Okay, important question for you. Since COVID has impacted everyone and everything, arts organizations, businesses have closed down or have suspended operations. How can we support artists and arts companies like yours? During this time, we have to take care of our deaf artists. At Deaf West, we have reached out to them a lot. We've been in touch via text mostly with a lot of the community too, just making sure that they're okay, that they feel safe and protected. That will help them in their future careers. Many of them have lost job opportunities during this time, and it's our responsibility to make sure to find opportunities for them to grow, perform, and hone their craft. We can't overlook financial support, I've even lent out some money to actors during this time. That's my small way of giving back to the community too. Hopefully together we can persevere and make it through these unprecedented times. And here's hoping it's over quickly and doesn't get drawn out so that our industry can get back up and running as soon as possible. At the end of these Deaf Spotlight interviews, I'd like to wrap up with some light fun questions. What's your favorite sign? Impossible. Awesome. Least favorite? Office. What's your deaf bing? It's certainly a habit of mine. What skill would you like to have? I wish I could act. What word or emotion would you like people to remember you by? positive. Well, it's been a wonderful discussion. Thank you so much for joining me and thanks to everyone for watching. It's been my honor. Let's do it again soon. Yes.